Coercive labor, in some form or fashion, has been an important part of our class since this semester began. Um, we've talked about slavery. That's probably the most important form of coercive labor in this class. And we've talked about it in different regions of the country. We've talked about it um, in different cash crop settings. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to recreate the institution of slavery. Now, what I mean by that is that at the beginning of the 19th century, leading Southerners, including people like um, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, they felt that slavery would die out within their lifetime, and there's a very easy to understand reason why. The economy had changed. Um, tobacco and the production of tobacco had really just drained the soil of any kind of nutrients in the original parts of the continent where slavery emerged. Um, furthermore, the, the economy was not as reliant on slave labor as it once upon a time had been. Um, that is going to change with what will come to be known as the Cotton Revolution. What the Cotton Revolution is going to do, guys, is, is really the same thing that the Tobacco Revolution had done um, for those early settlers in Jamestown. It is going to set off an insatiable appetite for labor. The cheaper, the better, the more productive, even better still. It's also going to really reshape the culture of slavery. Um, people like Jefferson, for instance, viewed slavery as a necessary evil. Um, could clearly see the contradictions in light of the American Revolution. We were never really entirely comfortable with what was going on vis-a-vis -vis slavery. That's going to change in the 1820s, 1830s with this Cotton Revolution. And people like John C. Calhoun are going to po posit that slavery is actually a positive good. It should expand as far and as wide as possible. Um, it was a virtuous institution, according to people of this variety, and probably most importantly of all, that the federal government had no real power or authority from stopping it from expanding. But I want to go back to this whole point that what the Cotton Revolution really does, really at the end of the day, is it sets off an insatiable need for labor. Um, and what this is going to do is it's really going to reinvent the institution of slavery. It's going to breathe new life back into slavery. I can't say that enough. It's not as if we just simply woke up in the early 19th century and decided that cotton would be a good cash crop to produce and we're going to make all this money. The guy that you're looking at on the screen, the bottom of the PowerPoint slide, if you're following along with us, that's a um, guy by the name of Eli Whitney. Some of you may know that name, and you probably will know that he is the man that is responsible for the invention of what comes to be known as the cotton gin. You're looking at a cotton gin there. Um, there's nothing overly complicated about it. What it's going to do is it's going to separate um, cotton straight out of the fields from its seed. Here's the thing. Even though we had cotton before the early 1800s, even though we knew what kind of profitability it had, what kind of potential it had, it was very difficult to produce. And it was said that even the most productive of slaves could only produce about one pound of cotton per day because you'd have to pluck out every single seed by hand. And you can understand how miserably time-consuming, labor-intensive, and you know, bottom line is frustrating that would probably be. The cotton gin was very simple. What it did was you were able to feed raw cotton into one side, crank that handle that you're looking at there on the side, and then what comes out on the other end is ready to consume cotton. What this is going to do is it's going to make the cotton crop viable basically everywhere, you know, as far, uh, far east as South Carolina, all the way west through Georgia, through Alabama, through Mississippi, through Louisiana, and into the eastern chunk of Texas, it is going to make it the preeminent cash crop. And not only that, it's going to make it the bedrock of the economy. All life revolved around cotton, economic, political, and otherwise. This was a terribly, terribly profitable crop. And it's Eli Whitney that basically opens up that door. Without the cotton gin, 
Um, as I've said, the, the idea that you could make this kind of money through cotton, that's a big question mark. So it's really the cotton gin that, that paves the way for the cotton revolution, and it's the cotton revolution that is really going to reinvent slavery. Now, here's what I mean as far as that goes. Slavery had been a controversial subject very early on in American history. As a matter of fact, the Founding Fathers um, were a bit split on this whole issue. And shortly after the American Revolution, Massachusetts goes ahead and it bans the institution of slavery. So it had always been a pretty controversial subject. But in 1808, what Congress is going to do is it's going to pass a law that says no more importing slaves from abroad. You can't import them from Africa, you can't import them from the Caribbean, you can't import them from beyond the United States. But one of the things that I ask you to really put in your back of your mind when it comes to the uniqueness of North American slavery, especially in places like Maryland and Virginia, was that you have a naturally increasing, a naturally growing slave population. We explain the reasons why. We don't really need to get into that idea once again. I just need you to remember for a minute that the slave population in those regions that no longer need slaves, it's growing, had been growing for the better part of a hundred years. Furthermore, this 1808 law didn't say anything about an internal slave trade, and, and as you can see where this one is headed, what you're going to see is what historians, some of us anyway, call the second um, Middle Passage. Uh, the first one was obviously from Africa to the New World. The second one is going to be internal. We believe that in between 1820 and 1860, more than 1.2 million African Americans were forcibly migrated from the Upper South, Virginia, Maryland, Kentucky, North Carolina, to the Cotton South, uh, where the cotton crop had become king. South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Georgia, th those were all cotton country, right, or cotton countries. In any case, you have to also keep in mind that this was something that terrified the slave community. On the one hand, let, let me be blunt, this is going to break apart slave families. I'll come back to this point here in a second, but uh, you, you constantly lived in fear of your wife being sold in one direction and your children being sold in another direction. You also have to understand that the, the, the cotton planters um, essentially played by different rules. Uh, their work regime, uh, the way they drove their slaves, if you will, uh, was far more intense than the work re regimes that were practiced in the upper parts of the South. Again, I'll come back to that point here in a second, but to be sold down the river, to be sold down the river, Mississippi River was something that struck fear into the hearts and minds of the slave community for generations and generations. What this domestic slave trade is also going to do is it's going to make the institution of slavery far more public. You will see slave auctions far more often. You will see them in the nation's capital. Keep in mind that Washington, D.C. is surrounded by not only one, but two slave states, Virginia and Maryland. And every day you would have an auction um, for slaves that was taking place in the capital of a nation that was predicated on the institution of human freedom. That's kind of crazy if you stop and think about it. You also have slave catchers that could make a really good living for themselves um, basically by kidnapping people and in some cases selling them into slavery. Not necessarily back to slavery, but into the institution of slavery to begin with. Let me give you one quick example. Um, several years ago, there was a film that came out entitled 12 Years a Slave. And 12 Years a Slave was the life and times of a free man from New York State, a guy by the name of Solomon Northrup. Solomon Northrup is kidnapped um, in New York, and he is illegally sold into slavery, and he spends the next 12 years of his life as a slave. Hence, we have the 
uh, the title, 12 Years a Slave, title of his autobiography. Um, Northrop is just one example of, of, you know, countless people that had this happen to them. And the reason being, even if you were not a runaway slave, um, even if you had not been living as a runaway slave for a dozen years or so, even if you could prove that you were a free person, which he could, by the way, um, you didn't really have any rights. You could not speak up in a court of law. There was very little that you could do to address your accusers. And this, too, is going to be something that the, um, the, the, the black community, let's just call it this way, the African-American community, is going to struggle with for, for decades um, at the behest of slavery. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the work regime on a cotton plantation because uh, I, I did insinuate that it was very different. It was very different. What the cotton plantations used as a labor system is what was known as the gang labor system. What we mean by this is that gangs of slaves were sent out into the fields and they would just simply be placed in charge of tending the, those, those cotton crops. The worst, most labor-intensive time of the year was clearly the harvest season, whereby everybody, every individual slave, was responsible for uh, approximately 200 pounds of cotton. That is an enormous, enormous figure. Um, it is a figure whereby if you did not meet that, they would strap you to the whipping post, which just so happened to be located in the middle of that plantation. That was not an accident. And they would beat the daylights out of you, um, even if you did hit the 200 mark. But, uh, you know, the, you, you were the last one. You were dead last. You were 202 pounds, but you came in dead last. Uh, same thing, that the person that came in last would get a whipping. This was designed to encourage productivity, but you have to understand, if you wanted to compare cotton labor as opposed to tobacco or something else, Cotton labor regimes had a lot more in common with the sugarcane industry that had emerged almost a century earlier in the Caribbean in the sense that it was far, far more labor intensive. Um, this, is, this is really going to be a game changer, um, like I said, politically, uh, economically, and especially culturally, because I said, as I said before, with more and more of these slave auctions, you're going to see more and more publicity surrounding the institution of slavery. You're also going to see a defense of slavery. Like I said before, Jefferson, Washington, and a lot of that early cohort saw slavery as a necessary evil. This new group of planters is going to see this as a positive good. And this new group is going to see its socio-political position enhanced by developments in the economy, including the 1837 uh, economic panic. I had told you this at the time when we were talking about this part of history, that tons and tons of farms were foreclosed upon in Mississippi alone. And when the bank foreclosed upon them, they tried to sell them at discounted rates, and people of the upper class variety jumped at the opportunity to add more territory. And so when they added more territory at bargain rates, I might add, what this did was it made their economic and political position even more consolidated. Um, at the same time, they are going to ban any sort of abolitionist activity whatsoever. Last time we met, I had told you about uh, George's attempt to put a bounty on William Lloyd Garrison's uh, head, the liberator publisher up in Boston, anybody that could bring him alive to Georgia where he might be tried for treason and summarily executed. Um, never obviously happens, but there again, you can see what kind of power the institution of slavery wields in the South. What I'd like to do right now is summarize and conclude what we just learned. What Cotton is really going to be responsible for doing is really expanding the, the, the landscape, the geographic landscape of slavery. It's a terrible, terribly profitable crop, 
And what it's going to do is it's going to breathe new life back into an institution that most people would have told you should have died in the early, um, early 19th century. By the 1830s, the stage had really mostly been set for a confrontation. Um, there is more and more people that are beginning to believe that the country needs to become all one thing or all another thing. And this idea of a free labor economy and a slave labor economy could not exist side by side. The next time we meet, I want to talk a little bit more about the world that was American slavery. And in a lot of ways, from the perspective of the slave. But for right now, that's all the time that we have.